Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hi. And our resident everyman, <laughs> Sam <Okay>. Schultz. <laughs> <Rude>. What? Hello. <laughs> you said I took hello from you, and now you I laughed know. when I but went you know what? I went hi. back and reviewed the tapes, and I was wrong. Yeah, it felt weird <laughs> saying hi. <laughs> I regretted it as soon as it came out. Right now, Missoula, Montana is experiencing a winter storm that the the uh, hyper-reach automatic text system has been wor- like warning me about for two days straight. Mm-hmm. It's been like, don't just be ready. It's going to get real bad. It was yeah. 36 degrees this morning. It's going to be six degrees uh, tonight. It's a pretty quick drop. And I don't it love a- it. Everything was wet and melted. And now it's going to be a solid sheet of ice. Yeah. And it was a beautiful morning. Too. It was like one of those nicest beautiful. mornings we've had yeah. in forever. I like watched the sun go behind the cloud and I was like, goodbye. I'll see you in five days. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's a long, long winter. It's a long time. I would like to ask you two where I should be right now. It's obviously not here. This isn't suitable for humans. <laughs> it's going to be the only place suitable for humans eventually. Yeah, uh, you don't got that coast to worry about. I think we true. need to stick right here uh, unless the volcano explodes. And then that case, you know. Yeah, we'll be fine. And by fine, I mean dead quickly. We'll be atoms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you so, think that you think see. i should stay right here no i don't uh, sarah give me a better answer where should i go go to butte Mon- oh. beautiful butte montana that's no, no. God, no. <laughs> they, gotta, they gotta talk about cantina almost <laughs> no um, it opened it opened it's it's open it's they don't open? have their liquor license right. yet but they're working oh, okay, that's, not that's, not cantina. Cantina. Then that's a taco that's bell that's a taco bell it's yeah. a regular old taco bell <laughs> oh i don't know you could Go to Argentina. That seems nice. nice maybe sure, interesting. Yeah. Like a different different flora around mm-hmm. you. Yeah, yeah a little closer new. to the equator. I'm gonna pick up Sam like by the scruff of his neck. I'm gonna pick him up like this. Take him out of my computer and be like, "Hi, Sam." And he's gonna be like this big, uh, <laughs> this, like four, four inches tall, and be like, "Where you wanna go, little buddy?" He's gonna say, <laughs> "He's gonna say Cabo," and I'm gonna sit up. <laughs> he's throw him all the way to Cabo. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I just want someone to do that to me. <laughs> Throw me to New Zealand where it's summertime right now. You sound like a man who's been awake for three days in a row. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> we are recording this right after Project for Awesome, which, and I have to say, thank you so much to everybody for supporting the Project for Awesome and everybody who got the SciShow Tangents butt facts zine. Yeah. That is so worth every penny. <laughs> I can't, I, I, did, I hardly even heard about it. I'm so excited that it exists. I just hey, got it. it doesn't quite doesn't quite exist yet, but we're well, working on it. exists in our minds and our <laughs> yeah. hearts. Yeah. Uh-huh. You made a lot of work for yourselves. That's the, what Project for Awesome is really about, about <laughs> yeah. doing things that your future self will regret. It might be two hours from now. It might be 12 hours from now. It might be 12 months from now when I'm still <laughs> making Hankler fish art. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. But first, as always, we have to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sari. Grab that shovel with your arm. I'm going to teach you how to farm. Plant some (laughs) seeds to grow some corn or beans or watch out. That has thorns. This field here is for flowers and that one next door is fruit tree land. (laughs) We have cows and goats and such with rabbits sleeping in that hutch. Feed them, groom them, help them grow. Our grass and weeds, they do mow. Chores from dawn till dusk and then sleep and do them all over again. While Stardew Valley's lots of fun, real life business takes a ton of work in science and tools and luck. And also sometimes you drive a cool truck. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Very literal. Every Very farmer literal. has a cool truck. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't get out of my head the idea of grabbing a shovel with my arm. Like how that would work <laughs> yeah. exactly. I just keep thinking like, like, does it stick huh? to it? Or do I have to get like in the huh? crook of the elbow? Yeah. And then like yeah. pick shovel. it up. Be like, I don't know hey, why I'm doing like it this little... way today. <laughs> well, you've been it's a like farmer a, for a like long Like a buddy time. buddy. In a cartoon, it would be me like going side to side with a little shovel. This guy. Well, but the, the topic is farming, which is... Oh boy, what is farming? Oh no, 
That's, I thought it was going to be easy, but now I don't think it is. That is my thought process and why I went with that for the poem. Just things that I think of when I think of farming. Uh, Because there isn't really a precise definition as far as I can tell. Farming is kind of like agriculture. And even that has loose boundaries. And I feel like the best way to describe it is if you, as a business... Or for money, or on like a larger scale, or or yeah, I guess it can't just be like a backyard situation just for me. That's not farm. I think that's, that's a garden. garden. That's that's it. Mm-hmm. Garden is small farm. You help nurture mm-hmm. living things, mm-hmm. animals, plants, bacteria? Question mark. Can you farm bacteria? Probably sounds right in my in my brain. Uh huh. That people then use or eat. In some way. What if I'm not human and I'm an ant and I create, I cut leaves and I take them back <sighs> and I grow fungus on them. Now I'm a subsistence farmer, but I'm an ant. So I think the real problem <laughs> here is, is like the, the, is the distinction between a garden and a farm. And to me, that's like how important it is to you. Like if you can get rid of the garden and that was like, oh, that's a bummer. Then you're not mm, a farmer. Mm-hmm. But if you get rid of the garden and you're like, this is a big problem oh, for boy. me and my family, you're a farmer. Right. It's not a, it's not a sharp line, but it's something. It's something that draws, draws a line somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I think that, like many words, we invented farming to apply to humans. And then when we saw animals doing agriculture, right. we were like, oh. yeah, that's kind of farming. Those look like uh-huh. little farmers to me. And that's where it gets kind of nebulous, right. is we are taking... Like like saying happy. That's a human thing. Is their dog right. happy? I guess. But maybe if the dog came up with the emotion word, it'd be something completely different. Sure. Maybe the leaf cutter ant would, would call growing fungus for their baby something completely different. But we call it agriculture. I, and agriculture is like uh, the sort of like catch-all word for all of it. But uh, maybe also just plants. No? I don't think so. Uh-huh. I think... It, I think agriculture also includes animal husbandry. Wait, what's horticulture? Is that the is that the plant version of agriculture? I think horticulture is the subset that is plants. Well done, Sam. You you really yes. you really you really knocked it out of the park there. That that <laughs> makes it so that agriculture is definitely everything. Yeah, somebody mm-hmm. else thought of this a long time ago and said, "Oh, we need a new word." Hort <laughs> hort. <laughs> Uh, what what should we call it? Planticulture? No, I think we should call it hort. Hort. <laughs> I, think we should, I think we should use the lesser known word for plants. Horts. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gerald in the back of the room was coughing, like choking on his own water yeah. and went hort, uh-huh. hort. And they were like, oh, Gerald, a great idea. That's a great, that sounds great. Horticulture. Everyone loves yeah. the word hort. Planticulture sounds stupid. Hort it does. Though, sounds Smart. Wow. So you don't know actually well, what it is, Harry. Yeah. Did you do anything on this? No one really knows. <laughs> no one knows where farm what? comes from? Oh, I, I did do I did do some research on where farm comes from, but it is very mysterious, which which you wouldn't think mm-hmm. for a word like farm. Um, but all the all the sources that I found really just were like, we we don't really know. Germanic, Saxon uncertain and disputed but it seems right. like where it's from is from the word the anglo-french fermer f-e-r-m-e-r oh. from firm f-e-r-m-e which means a rent or a lease oh, so specifically what? it is about the idea that these lower classes would rent or lease land or work land that they did not own like had a fixed settlement of this land, as opposed to anything to do with agriculture. It was right. all the business side of it, which is why I tried to include business in my definition. Right. Because apparently farming always has to do with like the Sp- leasing of the land. Started out <laughs> with a started out with a business thing. Interesting. I, I've looked up agriculture and horticulture in the meantime. Great. Um, agri agri comes from field. Hortus comes from garden. So Oh. That's what that is. And culture actually that isn't like uh, what we think of as culture, but it comes from from the Greek root for uh, to grow. So uh, and that's so like the, it's more like horticulture and agriculture are more the original definition of culture than the culture right. that we talk about. 
But that all mm-hmm. comes from, I guess, society growing, I guess. We live in a culture. Yeah. It's just like a big, big We're winding of- field of ideas all threading together and being out the thing that we exist inside of on this medium that is of a great big planet earth huh yeah and the internet speaking of the internet broadcasting also has farming origins oh. uh that was the weirdest word for broadcasting uh was first and foremost an agricultural method of sowing seeds so instead of planting uh, them in rows you cast you them throw it out there. them <laughs> And you yeah. broad broadly cast them, and that was the first use of it. And then later, people were like, "Man, that's a good word." That's and, great. <laughs> uh, used it yeah. to uh, for print materials and mm. any sort of distribution of information. But when you're broadly you casting start, culture, wow. so everything's related. Can yeah. you believe we're people? What a what a thing to get to be. Well, Sarah, I feel uh, more informed on farming and agriculture and horticulture and and broadly casting seed than I have ever been in my whole life. So mm-hmm. that did the job of SciShow Tangents, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you for doing it. Thanks, that was man. a really nice thing to say. I feel appreciated. <laughs> Great. And now that Sarah feels appreciated, it means it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show, where I'm honestly rooting for her to lose. This week, we're going to be <laughs> playing a game. It's called Farm or Tabled. So humans have tried <laughs> to farm many, many things, from vegetables to alligators. And while some of those attempts have been wildly successful, others have definitely not. So today, in honor of our wild successes and even more thrilling failures, we're going to be playing a version of this or that called Farmed or Tabled, where I'm going to talk about some kind of attempt that people have made to farm something, and you will have to say whether or not you think that that farm is still a farm or if it's been tabled. <laughs> it's like farm to table. Is that the joke that is being yeah, made here? Yeah, that's the joke, yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank, okay. you for, thank you for putting it out there so that everyone would know. Sure. All right, round number one. The American Frog Canning Company was founded by Albert Brohl <laughs> in the 1930s, <laughs> who claimed that his mother told him, son, if you want to make a success in life, raise frogs. My dad said a very similar th- thing to me. When I was a child, what? by the way, that he was like, you should <laughs> not that, but with catfish. He oh. was like, son, uh. th- catfish farming is going to be huge if you're ever looking for something to go into. And he wasn't wrong. Catfish farming is huge. Uh, Your but life anyway, so, so would have been different. different. <laughs> would have been I mean, yeah. Terry would still work for you, though. We'd be <laughs> oh, out definitely. Like, We'd be we out there have found our with way <laughs> with yeah. our little waiters. Yeah. yeah, Sam would make videos advertising our catfish, and Sarah uh-huh. would do science about them. So anyway, this dude started with a 100-acre farm in Ohio before moving to Louisiana for a more frog-friendly client. And climate with his farm, Broll took advantage of the fact that a few breeding frogs can produce thousands of tadpoles and farming them uh, so that he could sell frog legs throughout the country. Based on his methods, Broll wrote Frog Raising for Pleasure and Profit to teach others <laughs> how to create their own <laughs> frog farms. <laughs> Is the American Frog Canning Company still farming or has it been tabled? So canned frog legs, basically. That was the end product of this whole... Yeah, but yes, the, that's what what he was selling then, but it could be that the, the farm is now selling something else. But it's definitely frogs. It's not something. It oh, and this is real. Called, this is this yeah, is a this real, is real story. Yeah, this isn't yeah, a truth or fail. Real. This is that's throwing <laughs> me for a loop. Okay, all that was real. Now you have to tell me if it still exists. I was gonna say I hope this man was real, but he was real. <laughs> he, he was real. He did yeah. exist. Ah, oh, couldn't possibly still exist though. Have you never eaten frog legs? Uh, well, yeah, I guess you got to get them from somewhere. I think I've only seen them on cartoons. I've yeah. eaten frog legs, but not like, but only because it was frog legs was the vibe. It yeah. was like, we're going to eat yeah. frog legs now. And that's going to be weird. It wasn't like a dish your mom was serving up to you every, every week. Yeah, or something. no, it was no, okay. it was that like, all I remember, it was like a bunch of picnic tables all pushed together under a tent. That's what I remember at the time I ate frog legs. <laughs> I think if you're eating frog legs still, I feel like they'd be fancy frog legs and you wouldn't get them out of a can. But I'm, I don't think that's true. I'm going to go with it still exists. Oh, I think it still exists. But I think because we need frogs for dissection. I think oh. there are a bunch of middle oh. schoolers and I don't think we're running over enough frogs <laughs> in good condition to use them for dissection. That's yeah, very clever, that's uh, Sari. Well, Albert Broll was a doctor who had to leave the medical profession due to his lack of license, so he decided to turn to frog farming. <laughs> 
That's a good reason to leave the medical profession. <laughs> you still have time to leave your profession, Hank, and become a catfish farmer. I do. It would become a bit of a craze because it promised a way for people to make a lot of money with just a small pond. And he contributed to the craze with ads promising the tools of the trade. He argued that frog farming was good because everything in the wild wants to eat frogs, which must mean that frogs oh. are delicious. But in fact... Brohl actually got a lot of his frogs from frog hunters, not from farmers, and eventually frog hunting caused a dent in the population of frogs, so much so that Louisiana passed a law that prevented people from hunting them, which meant that he had to shut down his company. Now, in the 1980s, oh. when I ate frog legs, frog farming began to pick up, especially in Europe, Brazil, and Southeast Asia, thanks to research on how to raise frogs in artificial ponds and get them to eat non-moving things. But most frog meat today is still from wild populations, which poses a threat to their numbers. So not mm -hmm. does not exist anymore. Does not exist anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. He went out of business because of laws and regulations always messing with the free market. He should have done what <laughs> Sari said. He made yeah, he didn't really try very hard at all. He cheated to start his farm. He didn't yeah. even really farm the frogs. Yeah. So Round number two, hmm. though, snow farming. Uh, while commercial snowmaking equipment has been available since around the 15, uh, 1950s, uh, not all ski resorts are able to use them. In the 1970s, the Banff Sunshine Village Ski Resort in Alberta, Canada, decided to see if they could farm snow instead. They started by setting up steel fence posts in the ground above the tree line in the summer. And when the ground froze, they added fencing material to act as a barrier that caught the snow as the wind blew it, providing them with the valuable resource they needed to make the skiing possible. So is this Alberta snow farm still running as a farm, or do you think the idea has been tabled? Maybe I'm just a snow novice, but mm -hmm. I, and I don't spend a lot of time doing snow sport i feel like it'd be very hard to move even if it was yeah. touching a fence you would mess up the you wouldn't get that gnarly pow or whatever people say if you move it from a fence <laughs> yeah it's gonna be a compacted and bad so i'm gonna say it's tabled but it might be okay. better than fake than like manufactured snow even if it you know even if in in transport it loses something they're not transporting it far i would assume is that yeah is that yeah, the case? Yeah, okay. they do it at the resort. I think they still do it. The Banff Sunshine Village Ski Resort is one of the largest uh, snow farms around. Mm -hmm. and it has been going since the 1970s and still exists. They set up huh. more than 30 kilometers of snow fencing every winter. And they act like uh, kind of like trees at the lower parts of the resort. They collect the snow, have it pile up. And when there are big storms, they go out hunting for what they call whales which are large mounds of snow, and they find them, and the crew members use skis and their own body weight, sometimes even vehicles, to pack down the whales. And if there's enough snow to bury the fencing, the steel rods get uh, replaced with bamboo sticks uh, as the fence to be set above the snow to gather even more snow. So wow. they're able to just collect all the snow up there and they keep it there. Oh. But it's like more for, for later when it's later in the season, there'll be more snow there for longer. So they farm it, but they don't actually move it around, it seems like. Oh, weird. Okay. I wanted Sari to lose, and it's working. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm psyched out thoroughly. <laughs> All right, round number three, our last farm. Moose may be large and intimidating, but they also provide valuable resources if you figure out a no way, way to get them. In the 1960s, a farm was established in Kostroma, Russia, with the goal of farming moose for their milk which was thought to provide a cure for peptic <laughs> ulcers. Most of the year, the moose would wander around as wild animals, but as calving season approached, they would be lured in with oats so that uh, the moose milkmaids can collect their salty, acidic <laughs> milk. So, is the moose farm still a farm, or has the idea been tabled? We got other ways to treat peptic ulcers now. We're not, we're not bothering moose. Uh, that's not sustainable. I don't think so. They're too right. scary. I feel like it's the most wonderful wild idea. Once you start a moose farm, you can't really stop it because then you've got all these. Yes, you can. When the around. moose destroy your moose farm, then you have no choice <laughs> to stop it. What happens when they come back for oats and you don't provide them with oats? <laughs> then that's when destruction happens. You're oh. in like a stable, very precarious equilibrium no, no. where they mostly you... live their life on their own and then they come get ready to be milked, eat some oats, and then go back in the... It's goddess. <laughs> that does sound nice. That does sound yeah. nice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? 
What are is it is it Sam a no and Sarah's a yes? Yeah. Yes. And that means we have a tie game in the end wow. because it's real. Though I have some caveats because the the most <laughs> recent article we could find about it was from 2014. But based okay. on the content of the article and the fact that their website is still running and refers to tours, you can <gasps> tour it in oh, the year wow. 2022. We're assuming that it's still going. Uh, it has not been proven to cure ulcers, and doctors usually discourage people from drinking cow's milk when they have ulcers because it can make the ulcers worse. So that, I've, as far as we can tell, is not a good reason to be doing this. But here we have a quote from one of the dairy maids uh, who worked at the farm in 2004. Quote, they are lovely creatures. They really are. Much more interesting to deal with than cows, but more dangerous <laughs> as well. I was uh -huh. milking one of them when a motorbike passed by. She got scared, jumped right on top of me, and I had to be sent to the hospital. But this only goes to prove that you have to be really quick and alert when dealing with them. She really meant no harm. Wow, what an optimistic <laughs> person. This is a very detailed website. Faith is pointing out that there's a section of the website call, of photos called cuddling. This is a whole section for that. How to raise a tame moose. Don't do not do any of this, people listening. Don't don't sit and drink tea with your moose like these people are doing. Early spring is the only period while all the farm moose cows are prisoners in enclosures and must eat twigs only from this pile. <laughs> 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 I don't know why early spring, but they got to eat twigs only from this pile. They got to eat twigs uh -huh. only from this pile. Okay, I'm in. But you have to go during the moose milking season, so... That's important. The Ivan Susanian Sanatorium is the only recipient of moose milk. So they are only milking moose to give to a sanatorium? Wow. What are they doing over there? <laughs> we don't need to ask any more questions. We must okay. move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We <laughs> <laughs> so it's a tie game here at Sub Show Tangents. And next we're going to take a short break and then it will be time for the fact off. Welcome back, everybody. Now get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. The oldest continually published periodical in North America is the Old Farmer's Almanac, which goes back to 1792. And the 1863 edition had a circulation of around 225,000, thanks in part to its long-term weather forecasting. Everyone from brides planning their weddings to rabbis planning for the altar candles would write to ask about temperature and sunset conditions. So when a new editor in 1936 named Roger Scaife decided to get rid of the forecasts and replace them with average temperature and precipitation amounts, the oh decision boy. was not popular. What was the circulation of the 1938 edition of the Old Farmer's Almanac? So two years after they got rid of the forecasting. At its peak, it was 225,000. Okay. That's not as many as I would think. That's a lot of people, man. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. People, I suppose. Yeah, and that's not. They share, like, but everybody from least. brides to rabbis, I would assume millions. <laughs> <laughs> I still check it, but it, you don't get like the almanac anymore. I just Google yeah, farmer's almanac last frost. The amount of people who pick it up in the grocery store and thumb through it is probably mm -hmm. in the billions. But yeah. the people actually buy it, not so right. much. Well, there's only thirty. There's only thirty million people in the U.S. back uh, in 1863 as well. So keep that in mind. I think word got around. I think it was one third of whatever number you just said. You gotta do the. You have to do the math for me, buddy. Will you say the number one more time? Oh, my pencil. Two hundred twenty-five thousand. Are you gonna? You're gonna do long division on your paper? What the? What kind of tone was that to use with me? I did it for you. It's seventy-four. <laughs> seventy-four thousand is your guess. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's the ticket. I was I already did it on my computer, and I just thought it was very silly that you filled out, filled out a pencil. <laughs> uh, I think it was one hundred fifty thousand. I think it was higher. Well, well remarkably enough, it dropped to eighty eight thousand. Uh, he was wow. replaced in nineteen thirty nine, and the weather forecast soon returned. Take yeah, that out of here, <laughs> yeah, Roger. <laughs> it's not. You gotta know. You gotta know what your audience is looking for, even if those mm -hmm. forecasts are completely useless. And so, Sam, you get to decide who goes first. Okay, I think I will go 
first. Does my Do story it. contain any science? I don't know. You be the judge. A 17- <laughs> eight- <laughs> In 1783, an American revolutionary soldier was captured by the British and sent to a prison camp in the West Indies. Once he got there, he was given a slice of watermelon that was allegedly so mind-blowingly delicious that he kept the seeds from that slice and held on to them until he made it back to America. Now, the Revolutionary War ended in 1783, which was the year he went there, so he didn't keep them for, like, years or anything, but still, he made it back to sure. America with the seeds and started growing them. Flash forward to 1840 when a farmer named Nathaniel Napoleon Bradford crossbred the West Indies melon with another species and created the Bradford melon. This melon was sweet, sometimes being compared to cotton candy both in taste and in texture, and in fact, it was demonstrably sweeter than other melons. The Brix rating is a scientific measure of solids dissolved in liquids. It's often used to measure sugar content, and the Brix rating of a Bradford is 12, while the normal watermelons is 10. And it also had a thin, soft, easily peelable skin, more akin to another curcurbit, the cucumber, curcurbit. (laughs) Cucurbit, <laughs> I think. Oh, cucurbit. That makes way more sense. Thank you. <laughs> and its juice was used to make molasses and booze. A great melon all around. That sounds wonderful. And the United States tended to agree. In the 1850s, Bradford sold his seeds for commercial use, and they quickly became a hit. So much of a hit, in fact, that the melons were a prime target for theft by both people who simply wanted to eat some really delicious watermelons and by mm. organized melon wrestlers. So to combat this, <laughs> watermelon farmers turned to classic defenses like shooting the thieves. But they also oh used more God. unusual methods. <laughs> some farmers would poison random melons in their patches, and they would put up a sign that said, Hey, some oh of these God. are poisoned. Don't eat them. Uh, That didn't seem to stop 100% of the melon stealing because there were newspaper articles reporting incidents like one in Buffalo where six children were killed (sighs) by a poison watermelon that they stole. Uh, And even reports of watermelon farmers and their families dying from eating the wrong melon, like just forgetting which watermelon they had poisoned and dying. By 1880, there are even articles alleging that some watermelon farmers had electrified the melons in their field. A melon thief would touch the melon, get electrocuted, and die. It got so bad that for several years, more people were killed stealing watermelons than any other agricultural product aside from cattle. Eventually, though modernity caught up with the Bradford melon, produce started to be shipped really far distances by trains, and Bradfords with their soft skins did not hold up well to that kind of environment, especially compared to your average super thick-shelled watermelon. So capitalism sent the Bradford to Fruit Valhalla along with the Grove Michelle banana, except there was one little patch of watermelons in the Bradford family's backyard where they kept growing the melons after that for decades, uh, and even to the point where they themselves forgot that their melons were like the biggest fruit of all time. (laughs) People used to die for them. (laughs) Yeah. But in the 90s, uh, Nat Bradford, who's the sixth great-grandson of the original Nathaniel Bradford, found a book from the 1850s that, I guess, ranked how good fruits and vegetables of the time were. He went to the watermelon (laughs) page and saw that number one was the Bradford melon. So he reached out to a scientist who specialized in heritage seeds, learned everything that I just said, and started commercially growing Bradfords again. And you can buy seeds and whole fruit, except this year because the 2022 crop of these poor, delicate melons was destroyed by rain. I couldn't get any the, <laughs> this year. But I can. No. I could I could maybe get a Bradford melon. Or I could get Bradford yeah. melon seeds and I could grow my own You could own definitely Bradford get melon. seeds. Yeah, it seems mm-hmm. like you could grow them a lot of places because there was people in Buffalo growing them, people all over the country growing them. My goodness, so, yeah. that's exciting. Buy a genuine Bradford watermelon pickup only. How did they electrify the melons? Are that plants I couldn't conductive? Find. Yeah. There, there mm. was like newspaper articles from the 1800s that were like, somebody got zapped by a melon. I don't think there's any contemporary like uh, explanation of how that was the case. It's not a lot of science. You were right about that. <laughs> All right, Sari. I, lo- I loved that. Um, what, do, what do you got? So when humans farm animals for food, we don't perfectly recreate what it's like for that animal to grow up in the wild. And those changes can have consequences that we don't anticipate. For example, farmed salmon aren't fed krill and shrimp, so their flesh lacks the reddish-orange pigment and is a pale whitish-gray instead, unless farmers specifically add that pigment to their food. But other changes in farmed salmon are a little less obvious and a lot weirder, scientifically speaking. As early as the 1960s, fish scientists noticed that something was odd about the sagittal otoliths of farmed salmon. 
So these otoliths are basically tiny rocks that jangle around in the inner ear of bony fishes, and they help with hearing and balance. And in wild salmon, sagittal otoliths are usually made from a crystalline form of calcium carbonate called aragonite. Occasionally, their otoliths are made of a less stable form called vaterite, which doesn't jiggle in the same way and causes around a 28 to 50 percent loss of functionality. And farmed salmon are up to 10 times more likely to have vaterite otoliths instead of aragonite, so they have significantly worse hearing and balance than wild salmon. Some researchers thought this had to do with the hatchery tank environment being so noisy, the lack of enrichment for growing salmon, or a side effect of generations of selective breeding. But it turns out, According to a 2016 study, it found that these abnormal otoliths probably come from making farmed salmon grow as fast as possible. In salmon that they studied that were the same age, the biggest fast-growing fish had three times as much vaterite in their ears as the smallest, slower-growing fish. And we still don't understand the nuances of how these otoliths crystallize, but it's pretty clearly linked to growth rate. And these study authors worry that causing mass hearing loss in farmed salmon may limit conservation efforts because you can't just release a bunch into the wild and expect Mm -hmm. them to survive, Mm -hmm. uh, which Uh, was one thought to help replenish salmon populations. A separate 2021 study that I found tried to study this question and concluded that the, the bigness of the farm salmon kind of counteracted their lack of hearing and made them less likely to be preyed upon than smaller salmon. But they specifically studied farmed salmon in Norway and like other fish that eat fish as opposed to other predators. And one paper's experiment isn't necessarily conclusive. In general, the moral of the story is farming revolutionized a lot of things and can be good to help with overfishing or food insecurity. But whenever we change how living things grow, there are usually weird unintended consequences, like with ear rocks. Oh. Wow. Are there like clear problems with the salmon? Like they have have a hard time telling up and down or uh, hearing yeah. can like clap in front of them. Be like, hey, can you <laughs> hear me? They like they might behave a little bit differently and like be less mm-hmm. responsive. But I think most of the tests that I was reading assume that there is this hearing loss. Um and that the environments are just so different that we we haven't like put a a hearing fish and a half hearing fish together and clapped mm-hmm. or splashed. It's time for that research, Sari. We yes. need to go get mm-hmm. some farmed salmon and some wild salmon. I don't know how we're going to do it. You got to lure them with oats. <laughs> yeah, lure yeah. With oats. Catfish a... farmer Hank would know. That's true. Yeah, he would definitely know. In my alternate life, I would know all about this. Yeah, you could be making TikToks about catching salmon and you'd be just as big of a hit as you are now, if not yeah, bigger. It'd be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do dances with him. It would be great. But <laughs> that would be that's great, not yeah. what we have to decide today. <laughs> today we have to decide whether Sam or Sari's fact was better because they came in with a tie. And I think that a watermelon that that peep that that men would murder for mm. has to be the winner of today's episode of mm. SciShow Tangents. Congratulations, Sam. I'm gonna Thank go you. buy some Bradford watermelon seeds right now and get them shipped to my house. They're only ten dollars. Oh, wow. And you can make Ooh. so many watermelons from that. I'm going to come steal them, Hank, so you better, you better start poisoning <laughs> get, them. Get my watermelon poison get out. Get poison ready. Yeah. Uh-huh. But remember which ones are poison. Yeah. Most yeah, important we'll That's see. vital. That's vital. <laughs> it does seem important. And now it's time to Ask the Science Couch, where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. Emily17 on Discord asks, are there any animals that sort of do agriculture? Definitely yes, in some way. We've talked about this, I think, even on tangents, but uh, that there are that there are definitely animals who have relationships where they intentionally grow other organisms to consume. Like yes. leaf gutter yeah. ants are the, the most obvious example. They don't eat the leaves. They take the leaves back and then fungus grows on the leaves and then they eat the fungus, I think. Yeah, ants got little animals. They got little plants. Um, but the one <laughs> that I wanted to talk about that I learned about recently is the first non-human mammalian farmers. Ooh. We've seen it a lot in insects, but mm-hmm. uh, pocket gophers, we've known for a while, eat roots of plants. They they are small rodents. They have extensive tunnel systems, and they tunnel around, and then as roots dangle into the tunnels, they, they munch on the roots. That's where they get their nutrients from. 
And now we have evidence that they not only <clears throat> dig around their tunnels to find roots, but try and maintain those tunnels and like fiercely defend them in order to maintain that root growth. So they mm. like spread their own poop as fertilizer throughout the tunnels and really like carve out different areas and promote those plants growing above the tunnels so that they can eat the roots later on. They don't plant the crops. They don't go around and like planting the seeds, but they kind of nurture the plants through the way that they know how by spreading mm-hmm. poop as opposed to having a dedicated toilet space or something like that. I think it's really cute. And in the press release for it, there's a video of a plant just disappearing underground, oh. which would be very freaky if I was a human <laughs> on the surface and not a scientist watching this video. But mm-hmm. it's like the go from eating the roots and then it just goes whoop and disappears. <laughs> That's so cute. You know, like, I'd say... I'd say 60% of photos of pocket gophers are cute. Their teeth can be a little challenging. They're little bear hands. Oh, kind of I love like that. Human I love hands. A big, I love a big digging hand. I think that's fun. Yeah. They're cute. I, I, I declare they're cute. cute. That's really what it comes down to. Is uh, there, there are a lot, There's a lot of expertise shared around this, this room, but Sari knows what's cute and what's not cute. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, yeah, there's tons of animals that are doing agriculture. Definitively a little, answered. A little different than us in that there tends to be a pretty strong specialization to do one kind of agriculture, whereas we do every kind we could possibly imagine. We got lots of cool trucks that can do all kinds of stuff. Gator mm-hmm. farms and moose farms. Frog legs, shovel arms. That's the thing. <laughs> they, got less, they got less cool tools to do. They got their mouths to chew and their poop to spread. And that's about it. Well, if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on Discord. Thank you to Willow on Discord and at Tom M. Gaunt one and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's so easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents and become a patron. You get access to things like our newsletter, bonus episodes, and special thanks to patrons John Pollock and Les Aker. Thank you so much for your support. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's very helpful, and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, you can just tell people tell about, people us. about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our wonderful associate producer is Faith Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia buzz Our editorial assistant is Deboki Trakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Farmers regularly use nutrient-rich manure from animals to help fertilize crops. And historically, in regions of East and South Asia, communities of people used pig poop fertilizer that was made from digested human poop. Humans would sit on holes in an elevated building, and their poop would be funneled down and mixed with other food in the pig pen below. This poop recycling initiative helped limit the spread of disease from human waste, and it helped create nutrient-rich fertilizer that was better than straight-up human poop. But it wasn't perfect as some parasites and other diseases can be transmitted between pigs and humans. So today, these pig toilets have largely been replaced by more sanitary structures. At least we are mixing it with other food for them. (laughs) I I, uh, I need you to explain more that if what I am understanding is what I am understanding. They'd poop into a thing, and then the poop would get mixed with food, and then fed to pigs. Yeah, and pigs would eat the poop, and then the pigs would poop the poop. Uh, More poop. Poop a better poop? They poop a better poop, yeah. Think of the pigs like a filter. (laughs) Oh, don't put the poop in the pig food. That's... They... They don't mind. They probably are like, fuck yeah. They They probably love it. (laughs) (laughs) But for for a little while. Not not, (laughs) not long term. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.